The Millerite CNC power route is a very capable desktop CNC router. Let's talk about some pros, cons, and add-ons I've made to the machine. This video is not sponsored in any way and these opinions are completely my own. Hi, this is Bodie from Bodie Knows. Today I'm going to give a review on the Millerite CNC power route. I've had this machine for about two months now and been using it almost exclusively to cut aluminum, which is what I bought it for. There's a lot of things I like about the machine. There's also th some things I don't like about the machine. A little background about myself, nine to five, I'm a mechanical design engineer for a large manufacturing company. I design automated assembly equipment. So I have a lot of background with things like nuts, bolts, ball screws, linear rails, things like that. Forewarning, if I were to design this machine myself from scratch, it would definitely cost well over $10,000. So take all the opinions I give with a bit of a grain of salt. So to start, the first pro and the reason I bought this machine, it has linear shafts and ball screws on all three axes, and I think that's really important if you're gonna be milling aluminum. Over here, we have 16 millimeter linear shafts with ball bearings on them. This is the Y axis. On the X axis, you have the same thing, two sets of 16 millimeter linear shafts. And then on the Z axis, you have two sets of 12 millimeter linear shafts. All three axes have ball screws, a single ball screw for each. So the X and the Y have, I think that is also a 16 millimeter ball screw and a 12 millimeter ball screw on the Z. These work really well. I'm pretty happy with them. I personally think they're a bit undersized and we'll get to that. I'd also prefer linear rails. Linear rails are not quite as good at handling debris as linear shafts. These seals right here on the linear bearings do work really well. However, this is also a con. There is a ton of debris that builds up on these rails and I'll get to that. The machine is made out of 60 millimeter aluminum extrusions and five eighths thick aluminum billet plate, which I'm really happy about. It does give the machine a lot of rigidity and strength. It's really heavy, it well, weighs well over 100 pounds. I like how on the billet aluminum plates, there's lots of room to add things if you want. So for example, I've added this coolant system and I was able to just drill and tap holes into that and that works really nicely. It does come with a T-slot table, which I really like. This is very nice, thick aluminum. Unfortunately, it's some sort of weird metric sizing. It is not a standard T-slot. Um, if you try to buy components that are made for CNC machines, they typically won't fit. I did find a set of eight millimeter threaded rods with some hold down clamps off Amazon. I like these, but I do wish you could use standard T-slot components with them. The motors I like, these are NEMA 3.4 motors, um, big on the X and Y axes. I have not had these fail on me yet. I've crashed many times and broke the workpiece free before the machine stalled. So overall, really happy with these. I have added some heat sinks to them. I'll get to that on the cons. The Z axis has the same frame size motor, just not quite as large. Also happy with that. So overall machine construction, I'm happy with it. Um, there are some, definitely some cons, but the bones here are really good. I'm really happy with the bones. The joints could use a little work. The machine has a really solid elect electronics enclosure. This is a, it looks like a custom made sheet metal um, frame. It has an acrylic top. You can look in here and see all the components. I do like how you can see in there. I really like how there's a big e-stop button right on the front. I push that all the time. It's really convenient. I, don't, I really don't know what you'd do without that. It does have a cooling fan on it. I have a sock on it there to act as a filter to keep metal chips from getting in. On the back, the connectors are all really solid. You can see here, they're well, well designed and well built. I actually would say this electronics enclosure is the most thoroughly thought through part of the machine. So now we'll talk about some of the cons of this machine. Again, the bones are all really good. Some of the joints holding it together though could really use some work. Remember that my background is industrial equipment design, so I have pretty high standards. I'm used to working with large budgets and I understand that this is not a high budget machine. So take everything I say with a grain of salt. To start off, the linear shafts and bearings, although I do like them, I think they're a bit undersized in my opinion. If you Google or look on McMaster, the rated load of a bearing this size, they're a hun several hundred pounds a piece, but we're not going for rated load here, we're going for rigidity. So I would have liked to have seen the X and Y rails be at least 20 millimeters 
and maybe the Z 16, but I would have just made the Z 20 as well. All of the bearings have preload screws on them. So if you look over here, you can see they have adjustable preload screws. They have them on the sides and the front, but unfortunately there is no way to access the holes on the front. Millwright neglected to add the holes so that you could get a wrench in there, which I think was an oversight. That problem exists on every single bearing on this machine. I haven't had an issue yet, but I suspect since I did not Loctite them tight that they are loosening over time and that's a bit disappointing. The ball screws all lack grease zerks, which is a huge problem in many regards. First off, ball screws need to be lubricated to function correctly. Secondly, they are not covered on this machine, so you're bound to get debris inside the ball nut, which is terrible, and grease would help not only lubricate, but push that debris out. And thirdly, and perhaps the biggest issue with this, is not only are there no grease zerks on the ball nuts, but the hole for the grease nut is not filled, giving debris and chips a clear passageway right into the middle of the ball nut, which is the absolute last thing you want. These E-chains, or cable carriers as they're sometimes known, I call them E-chains. I'm going to talk about this X-axis one first. What I, what's shown here is a modification I've made. I 3D printed a bracket here to hold this E-chain. This is how E-chains are meant to be held in place. They should have a constant 180 degree bend and be secured at the end of the chain and at the beginning of the chain. All cables going in and out of the E-chain should have strain reliefs and there should be no strain or bending on the cables. That should all happen inside of the cable carrier. That's the idea of the cable carrier. Unfortunately, the way this machine comes, this end of the E-chain is just flopping around in the wind. There's nothing holding it. The cables are just completely connected right to the motors, no strain reliefs major oversight in my opinion it is fairly easy to 3d print a bracket but i wish millwright would have done that right away on the y-axis the problem is a little worse perhaps not quite as bad since it is secured on both ends but this chain is not anywhere near long enough for the application this is while it is a 180 degree bend this is not correct it's just up again flopping in the wind down here it's not constrained at all um, you would definitely want to add some strain reliefs here. These wires, again, just flopping, and that's going to lead to premature wear of the wires. The plexiglass you see here, or polycarbonate, I've added this myself. So the machine does come with thinner and shorter guards, and I think what that's meant to do is keep debris off of the, these shafts. And while that does function, if you're cutting really thin wood, most of the wood will get stopped by the guards. If you're cutting anything taller, like this piece of aluminum, you may as well not even have these. The, the chips go everywhere. They get all over the rails, all over the, the ball screws. I would really have liked to have seen accordion ball screw guards on here, as well as um, accordion guards for the shafts, or perhaps just a three-sided accordion guard going all the way across, both on the X and Y axis. The Y axis ball screw underneath the table down here is not as big of a problem since it's fairly guarded from chips and dust from above. However, chips and dust will get down there. They get everywhere when you're cutting aluminum, especially. An issue I had assembling this machine, and I think an issue that persists, there are way, way too many screws and nuts going on. If you look here, I haven't done a count, but I would bet that it's well over a thousand screws and not only is there a high number of screws but there is a vast array of screws pan head socket head flat head phillips hex you name it it's on this machine pretty much every single length when we design equipment for indu to industrial standards we typically like to standardize on a couple different screws not only to make it easy to install but make it easy to work on and that just does not exist here this machine, it took me well over a week to assemble it. And again, I do this for a living. I think the high number of screws and nuts is confusing and it takes way too long to put it all together. The fact that almost every screw threads into a nut is a problem. If you look somewhere like right here, this is a nut on this screw. I would much rather see tapped holes. So for example, you could have just tapped the hole in this plate. Um, there's very few tapped holes. Here's some of them on the linear bearings, although Millwright did not make that themselves. In general, when you're designing industrial equipment, nuts are a no-no. You want to try to use tapped holes as much as possible. 
It is more expensive to do that, but not only does it give you a sturdier machine, it makes assembling and working on the machine much easier and more successful in the long run. These billet pieces of aluminum, as I mentioned, they're, they're big and strong, but they are water jet cut. So if you zoom in right here and look at this surface, you can see this is not a precision machine surface. This is water jet cut. Typically water jetting is used to rough out the profile of part and then you finish machine the outside. If you're only going for a rough profile, that's fine. But here when you have mating components, you do not want water jet cut profiles. The biggest area where this is an issue is the router mount. So this, these two pieces of aluminum here that mount the router, I'll get to some more issues with this in a minute, but these are not machined. They are not precision at all. You may as well have blocks of wood here minus the rigidity. That means that every single time you touch, you undo these screws to remove the router, work on it, whatever, you have to re-tram it every single time you put it back in there. There's no precision features on here. These plates are not square to this plate. Nothing is square to itself, which brings me into its, the next issue and part of what's so wrong with so many screws going on here. Nothing on this machine is square to itself. You can try your best to get it as square as you can. Again, I come from the industrial world where we use granite tables and precision metrology equipment to get everything set up. So a bit of a biased opinion here, but there is nothing square on this machine. And when you do try to get the router trammed to the table, meaning square to the table, perpendicular to it, your chances of getting anywhere close are slim to none because of this router mount. There's too many screws and no precision surfaces here, so your chances of getting it square, again, are close to nothing. I've tried using shims and indicators to get it as close as I can, but it's just not gonna happen. My next upgrade for this machine is my own machined router mount, I'd like to see a one piece design with a precision hole that is parallel to the mating surface. And then I would also like to see jack screws on the back so that you can adjust everything and tram it in and then lock it down. Right now, when you're trying to move things around and lock it down, you just, you're, fight, you're, you're fighting yourself and running in circles. I talked earlier about how I've added some heat sinks to these motors. So I, I am running for a long time. I've had some, some machined pieces that take over eight hours and the motors get extremely hot during that time. Uh, like they will burn you if you keep your finger on there for more than a second or two. So I got some extruded heat sinks online. I use some heat paste, heat sink paste behind and then zip tied them on and those do work fairly well. I'd like to add another set here. I don't really know what could be done about this except for adding the heat sinks from the get-go. You could obviously water cool them, but that would be quite an endeavor and expensive, but they do get really hot. Um, I do have the preload on the bearings set fairly tight because I want everything to be rigid. That may be part of the problem, but something to be aware of. The anti-racking mechanism that keeps the each side of the Y-axis parallel to each other, it's really hokey. It does not work well. If you look over here at this bearing, you can see how much it moves when you put force on it. So just putting about 10 pounds of force there, it, it racks a lot. Cable racking, anti-racking systems like this are typically used in drawers just to keep them from moving all over the place, not in precision machinery. So there's a, a whole mess of nuts and bolts and spacers holding these wires together. It, it does not work well at all. Unfortunately, I'm very disappointed with this. That means that when you're cutting on the far left or far right side of the Y axis, your rigidity goes way, way down. You really wanna to try to cut as much as possible in the middle of the machine. Otherwise you're gonna have major uh, vibration issues, especially on aluminum. The machine does come with homing switches on all three axes, here, here, and then one on the back. They, they're they nice to have, but their repeatability is garbage. It is plus or minus about 15 thou, which is not good enough at all for machining aluminum. Another issue, I'd like to see a guard on here. So if you look from the top, you can see that the electronics and the wires are completely exposed and when you're cutting aluminum chips will get in there and cause a short circuit which will cause a build to stop as the software gets an alarm 
and nothing is more frustrating than being seven hours into an eight hour cut and having the whole thing ruined because a chip got in your switch. So that's what I've got for cons on the machine. Again, I am very critical. I have high standards and part of what makes me so critical of it is there's, there's really good bones with this machine and I think a lot of good thought went into it, but I'm disappointed to see some shortcuts and some cheaping out that led to some bad joints that really holds the machine back from its full potential. Now we're going to talk about some of the add-ons and modifications I've made to this machine. Some of them are things I realized needed to happen after having it, others I knew I was going to add from the beginning. So these are just all my own designs. First thing is the E-chain mount. Up here I just 3D printed a piece that holds the E-chain in a nice 180 degree bend. I'll show you what it looks like, how it should look when an E-chain travels. There should be a constant 180 degree bend. And you can see when it moves, it's, it's real nice. That bend half is isolated, no strain in the cables. Very happy with this. I also added, I, ha I have a coolant system here, which I'll talk about in a minute. I added some mounts for these hoses as well. Um, I'd like to see something similar on the Y-axis, but it's not quite as important. So the coolant system, I knew I was gonna do this from the beginning. I have some lock line here with a manifold going down to the spindle. Very happy with this, it works really well. The system over here is made out of components purchased from McMaster. I wanted a fog buster, but they're like 500 bucks, so I just looked up the patent and designed my own. It's really simple. I have a regulator here to control the inlet pressure that is teed into two, two ways. One goes to a flow control that then controls the amount of air going to the nozzle, and the other goes through a water filter, also from McMaster. This is about 30 bucks that I've turned into a coolant reservoir. You need this because this is pressurized coolant here. So I have the regulator set at about 50 PSI. If you were to blow something up with water at 50 PSI, it would make a huge mess. So you want something nice and sturdy. Both tubes go down to a manifold here where the, the pressurized coolant and air mix. Since both are pressurized, you're not sucking something into a, you're not sucking the liquid into a very high velocity airstream. So it doesn't atomize, it stays as droplets, which keeps it from getting foggy. I have another flow control here to control the flow of coolant, and then you can do whatever you want with lock line. Lock line's awesome. Any nozzle you want, any length you want, T, Y, four way, whatever you want. You can do anything. The coolant I'm using is a cool mist. I believe it's K77, formula number 77. It works well. I mix it with distilled water. It does leave some residue, which is a bummer. So if you look here, some of these little teeny tiny aluminum chips just don't go away. You have, even when you scratch them, it's just kind of stuck. There's a film and that gets on your fingers, which if you notice, I'm wearing a shirt filled with aluminum chips. I have a, an outfit that I only wear in here because aluminum gets everywhere. As I mentioned before, I've added these polycarbonate shields. These are about twice, <clears throat> twice the height and twice the thickness as what comes with the machine. This is about $70 with the polycarbonate. It does keep the chips at bay a little better, but if you're cutting anything big, again, I don't know if it's worth it. Everything goes everywhere. I have another panel that goes up front. It's removable so that you can keep the chips from flying right at you when you're looking in front of it. I also have a spoil board here made of Delrin. So tons of videos out there on CNC spoil boards. Almost everyone makes them out of MDF. But if you're making them out of MDF and you want to use coolant, that's no bueno. The MDF will, will swell big time and your nice flat spoil board will be no more. So Delrin is a super stable uh, plastic. Sometimes no, it's also known as acetyl. Delrin is the trade name. Um, this is about a hundred bucks worth of Delrin that you're seeing right here. It's five eighths of an inch thick. So I just machine this off flat and then I have a nice flat surface. Um, you can, the beauty of Delrin is it, it's fairly rigid and fairly tough. So I have, uh, dowel pins in here to give me a square mounting surface. I have a, an area machined out that I can put a corner block in. You can really do whatever you want with Delrin. So I would highly recommend doing that, even if you're not going to use coolant. Delrin is way better than MDF. It's a little more expensive, but worth it. So I'm using both router mounts that come with the machine. The instructions only say to use one, and it tells you that if you want to use the top one, you have to put it in ahead of time. 
What sucks is that for rigidity, you really want both of these. And if you neglect to put the screws in ahead of time, there's no way to get to the back of this plate with a wrench to put the screws in. So I've had to drill holes in this plate so that I can get a wrench in from behind to adjust this router mount. And let me tell you, it's a bitch to get in back there. So I would have really liked to have seen some holes pre-drilled and an instruction on how to get this router mounted on there. Um, as I mentioned before, the machine doesn't have grease irks. I've added grease irks. You can get them at Menards for like 10 bucks, so not a big deal at all. I just wish Millwright would have told you that ahead of time. The anti-racking system, as I mentioned, I'm not a fan of, but I did get bigger cables for it, so the machine comes with 1 16th inch metal cables. I've upgraded to 3 seconds, and I also got the highly flexible cables from McMaster. It's about 20 bucks and probably worth it. You may have mentioned I have socks on my router and you may be wondering why is that there. So any dust, chips, anything that you're cutting, it's gonna get into the air. This router is air cooled, so it sucks a lot of air through here. Wood dust, maybe not that big of a deal in a router, but imagine aluminum chips going through a, an AC motor, not good. So these socks just serve as a filter. You can see here that they do catch a lot of chips going through. You could probably come up with something a little fancier, but just throwing some old socks on there and throwing them out when they get too full of metal is fairly simple. Even with this filter though, metal does get through little tiny chips and dust and it clogs up the router. I've gone through two routers now. It seems that after about 24 hours of aluminum machining, you have to take the router out and blow it out with compressed air. I have a second one just so that I have a new one ready to go at any time. This router, the, D, the DeWalt DW618, it is pretty easy to take apart, so not a big deal to clean it out. So now we're going to do a quick demo of machining aluminum. What you're seeing here is about a 2 inch thick cast aluminum plate. I typically use cast aluminum, you could use 60, 61, 70, 75, whatever, but cast aluminum comes super flat and within 5, five thou thickness, so really nice. Uh, most of the videos I've seen out there of people cutting aluminum with desktop routers, they're, they're either poo-pooing it and saying that it doesn't work and that you need to go get a, a VMC or a Tormach or whatever. And if you're watching this video, chances are that's out of your budget. The other thing I see a lot of is people using lower end or maybe even equivalent machines, but taking super, super light depths of cut um, and material removal rates that are just way lower than what is attainable. So. I'm able to obtain about one cubic inch a minute of a material removal rate, which is on the higher end of anything I've seen out there on a router. Um, I'm gonna do a video on this in the future, but part of the keys to getting part of the key to getting that material removal rate is using a Daytron single flute end mill. Um, I, I will do an entire video on Daytron single flute end mills, but the, the quality of the machining and the speeds you can get out of that are an order of magnitude bigger than anything else I've found. So that is the key. Um, also, you, you gotta be willing to break some bits to get there. Um, these are about $70 a piece, unfortunately. So if you're scared of breaking them, you're never gonna push the limit and you're never gonna find out what you can do. So to get a cut going, um, this video is not gonna cover the software and everything, but I just wanna walk you through the basic steps. Uh, you gotta put, I wanna put this guard back on. Um, you're definitely going to want to use some earplugs and good earplugs. So I use some 3M over the ear, like industrial earplugs, earmuffs. This is extremely loud, especially when you're going at 24,000 RPM. I, I typically wear earplugs in addition to the earmuffs. My girlfriend is usually very upset upstairs. She can hear it very clearly. You can even hear it outside. So I don't know what you can do about that. It's just part of the thing. Extremely loud. So always wear earplugs, I always wear safety glasses, I even wear a respirator sometimes if there's if it's getting really dusty. I turn my coolant on over here, so I just have a valve. Um, this is hooked up to a 20 gallon oil cooled air compressor, which is about 500 bucks from Menards. I did have it hooked up to a six gallon pancake compressor at one point and it could keep up, but it was running almost constantly and I knew after a day of that 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 was just not sustainable. So turn your air on. Turn your coolant on. I use this valve down here to keep the turn the coolant completely on or off. I typically let the air run for about a minute so that the coolant can get in there and start running at its prescribed rate. 
I'm going to turn the router all the way up to full speed. Again, I'm using the Daytron single flute so you can run 24,000 RPM. And here's what it sounds like. So let's analyze this cut a little bit. Each of these four pockets is the exact same volume. As the depth of cut increased, the diameter decreased. Also, each of the four material removal rates was fairly similar, ranged from about three quarters of an inch, a cubic inch per minute to one inch cubed per minute. The first cut looks best, I think. Minimal chatter there on the walls. I do want to point out that there are quite a few chips in there on the finishing passes. If there were fewer chips in there, maybe if you blew them out with an air gun, uh, you'd have much better surface finishes in there. But that first cut at an eighth inch deep, 100 thou step over and 70 inches a minute looks pretty good. It is a pretty shallow depth of cut in my opinion. The second one I think also looks pretty good. This is 3 16 inch depth of cut, 1 16th radial step over and 65 inches a minute. Third pass, and this is my preferred cutting strategy, it's a quarter inch depth of cut, 1 16th step over, and 60 inches per minute. And then the final pass, I just wanted to show that you can go really deep if you want. You could probably go even deeper than this, but this is 5 16 inch depth, 1 16th radial, and 50 inches per minute. 
These are all taken at 24,000 RPM, and again with that Daytron 6mm single flute end mill. Overall, I think it's a good cut. You could do better on the finishing passes. I do want to point out here, you may have noticed that the corner of this bar is cut away now, and it wasn't when we were machining. I just cut that away with a hacksaw. It was a Ryobi Sawzall. If you're intimidated from getting into metal machining because you think you're going to have to buy a whole new array of specific metalworking tools, it's really not the case. Any woodworking tools you have for home projects, woodworking, whatever you're doing, you get the right blades for them, they'll cut aluminum just fine. So to sum up my review on the power route, I'm happy with it. I am making good cuts. I'm, I'm cutting what I wanted to and what I originally set out to cut. However, I think there's quite a few improvements that could be made. It's a good machine, it has good bones, but there were some shortcuts taken and some cheaping out that occurred that is holding the machine back from its full potential. Would I recommend it? Yes, but after all the time I've put into upgrades and all the money I've spent on them, I think for that additional one to $2,000 that I've spent plus the time, I may have been better off just buying a more expensive machine to begin with. However, I wouldn't have had as many learning experiences as I've had, so I think it's a toss-up. If you like what you've seen in the video, I'd encourage you to check out Millwright CNC. I think they have some good options out there. They seem like a good company, and I wouldn't hesitate buying a new machine from them again. However, I would like to see some improvements made on this machine. If you like what you saw in this video, please like and subscribe for more content like this. I'll be doing some more videos on aluminum machining on desktop CNCs, specifically on which end mills you should be purchasing. I also do a lot of 3D printing and I'll be doing some videos on getting high quality functional parts off of desktop 3D printers. You may have seen that most of the videos out there on desktop printing are focused almost solely on aesthetics. If you're interested in getting high quality functional parts and aren't so concerned about aesthetics, I may have some tips for you. You can get almost industrial quality 3D prints off of a $500 desktop printer. Thanks for watching.